who's more right? Cloud people reduce faith to a kind of inconsequential leisure activity, like doing crossword puzzles or collecting refrigerator magnets or being wine connoisseurs. In between these extremes, the rest of us need a third alternative. We don't want faith to be a fight, and we don't want faith to be a fog. We want our faith to be a quest, a quest for God and with God. For those of us who live in the zone of wonder and curiosity, faith and doubt, desperation and hope, maybe we could say that for us, faith is like a ship that we're sailing on. Our beliefs are like planks in the hull and the trials and disappointments and enigmas of life are like the storms and icebergs and reefs that sometimes threaten to sink us. Sometimes old planks spring a leak and have to be replaced, often when we're far from shore. We might say that God is the source and the goal of our quest, and that God is the mysterious sea upon which we sail, and that God is the wind we raise our sails to receive. We might say that fellowship is what we experience with fellow travelers on our ship of faith. We might even say that theology is the necessary maintenance of the hull and decks and sails so that our ship stays seaworthy for generations to come. In all of this, of course, we need to remember that maintenance of the ship is not the point. The quest is our experience of and with God. The great French philosopher Blaise Pascal said it simply and well, we are embarked. In other words, we aren't just theorizing about a hypothetical journey or planning a potential voyage for someday in the future. We are already at sea, actually underway in the wild adventure of sun and wind and wave and tide. I can't help but think of the way Jesus made sure to lead his disciples off of dry land and out into the deep as if to say, pay attention friends, this is what the life of faith is like. Sometimes on my journey, I've experienced God in extraordinary ways in dramatic surprises or soul expanding insights or unexplainable mystical encounters. But more often, I felt God's reality in the simple encouragement of a friend in the gentle inspiration of a sermon, or in the familiar ritual of the Eucharist. And I'd be less than honest if I didn't also say that at times I found myself in the spiritual doldrums, cast adrift and wondering if the wind would ever blow again. But through it all, I find myself between unfathomable depths above me and unfathomable depths below me, captured by the call of the sea and the thrill of adventure, which are for me beautiful images for God, whose grandeur and wonder surpass all words. So I wonder, do you find yourself more compelled by the Capophatic tradition that we can speak confidently of God? If so, what are the images that work best for you and that mean the most for you? Or maybe you're more compelled by the apophatic tradition that at the end of the day, human language always fails and silent, reverent wonder is our best theology. How do you try to reach that healthy balance where you use images that help you explore and search for God, but never become over-dependent on them? How are you embarked on a journey of seeking for God and keeping the quest alive. Well, I just wanted to open up some space. Uh, if folks wanted to share any reactions to his video, to his notion of being embarked, or the idea of a life with God being about being, you know, on we're the ship on this the water that holds us and moves us and the air and the wind that blows and um, moves us as well. And so any responses to any aspect of the video uh, or particular images? Yeah. And w before you talk, will you just say your first name? My first name is Jeff. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, all of this raises 
a question for me is wh what direction does the Bible give us in thinking about God? Because, you know, it gives us some direction from the Old Testament where he's a pretty strong guy who smites down people. And, I mean, that's a tough guy. You better shape up with him. And then, I don't know if this is in the New Testament, but the idea that God is love, he, he's much more... Anyway, so, you know, are we on our own here, or does the Bible give us some direction? I'm not sure. Yeah. Either responses to Jeff or responses to the video? You have to think a while. Okay. Yeah, I'll come over. Well, both the Old and New Testament give so many names to God. You know, there's Creator God, there's <clears throat> Abba Father. There, I mean, the list could go on and on. Um, and, you know, some of the ones in the Old Testament aren't the smite God. They're the, the loving, they're the good shepherd. Um, so um, I think it's it's just interesting, and, of course, our Jewish brothers and sisters didn't want to say his name out loud and and that's always just kind of struck me as wow that really is the ultimate reverence you know so um i think this is really for me right now this whole embarking on a journey thing it's going to be interesting thanks for that Okay, we'll have more more questions and more th aspects with this. Um, I I appreciate it how you raised in the in the Jewish tradition and right even, you know, in Hebrew you don't write out, you know, it's Yahweh, and just even being aware of there's a sense throughout throughout the text that any time you say here is God, that you know that's part of the one of the commandments and things that we're not supposed to make idols or to make images that become things that we get captured by and then get limited by because God is also beyond you know, our understanding. So I'm gonna take some threads from this video, come to some of what you're also bringing up, Jeff, and, and just give a little bit of some narratives related to thinking um, about God and our theology uh, of God and, and just a little bit of situatedness within the conversation that he's raising. And, and then for us, we'll do some more dialogue around that as well, okay? Um, so when I was uh, today knowing I was gonna get to hold space for this tonight, first of all, I was laughing um, a little bit because on Sunday, uh, during my sermon, I said something to the effect of, I don't really care what your thoughts are about the Trinity or something to that effect, I think. And so I think it's a little ironic that now I get to talk about God and the Trinity tonight. And part of what I meant by that, though, when I was saying is, um, I actually, I deeply think that our thoughts about God matter for how we live. The images that you have of God impact what you think it means to be Christian, if, you know, we talked at our table a little bit about how Jesus functions for many of us as the image of the invisible God. And so who's Jesus? And kind of how he was, he started off in the video where it's like, he's like, what God are you talking about? Because what we think about God impacts deeply how we actually do live. Um, and, and so that's where what I don't care so much about <laughs> is if we allegedly have all the right theology and yet it doesn't change how we love or that we understand that we're not God. And, um, and so, you know, in talking about God and, and thinking about God, I, I actually am very glad we get to talk a little bit about it tonight. Um, so just a little bit about within the Christian tradition, the doctrine of the Trinity. He puts the symbol in there for the Trinity. And this is one of those pieces that's a very <laughs> complex part of Christian faith and doctrine. And there is a lot of wrestles, uh, wrestling in the early church around the notion of the Trinity and wrestling with what do we do with the fact that there's Jesus, that there's these different images from the Hebrew Bible about who God is 
and kind of what's the view of God that's going to get to flourish and be the central one. So in the early Christian church, right, they're wrestling with, are we a tritheistic faith or are we a monotheistic? So historically, the Jewish faith is one where hero Israel, the Lord, your God, the Lord is one. And then if Christians are, you know, or people who are following the Jesus way are saying Jesus is God, they're, they're wrestling with this in the early church. There is actually no mention of the Trinity in the Bible at all. Like there's not a doctrine of the Trinity verse, right? Like or passage or book. They're um, often one of the central verses that's utilized to name and think about the Trinity comes from 2 Corinthians 13. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. And um, I would say, this is just me saying this, like we see throughout actually the scriptures, the sense that God is breath, which we speak of as spirit in the Christian tradition. God is, right, breath, spirit, wind. Um, God is creator, you know, and we see, as you were naming, all these different images, images of a mother hen, the God who sees me, right? You've, some of you have done studies around, right? El Shaddai and the different names for God. But the earliest Christians are really trying to make sense of who is Jesus. And the Gospels themselves are arguing for the divinity of Christ and saying that this isn't just some random guy, but this is actually God who has come incarnate. Then, um, and this is just for any of the nerds in the house who want to know this, um, Irenaeus was one of the early church fathers who wrote about first the doctrine of the Trinity, saying that they were all differing persons but the same substance. And this starts to become a real wrestling within the church about what do we do with this? And there were controversy and people fighting about it and, and what do we do with this? And this led to then what the council that was called in 325, the Council of Nicaea. So we sometimes, even though as Congregationalists we're non-credal, meaning we don't all have to say, yes, <laughs> I for sure agree with everything of this creed and that I'm in. We say we're committed to following Jesus and being on a journey together. But right, we believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven, or maker of all things, I made that up, maker of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, begotten from the Father, this is the major fight part, only begotten, that is the substance of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one substance with the Father and the Holy Spirit. Uh, yep, and that's the, the creed. Yep, that comes out from... <laughs> yep, yep. And really wrestling, and they were trying to say this idea that God is one substance um, with, and that Jesus is the only begotten from the Father. They were really wrestling with this and saying that, that this is a central part of Christian faith and doctrine, is that Jesus is divine, that it's not like there's multiple gods there's one God. Jesus is the image of the invisible God. And so since that time, right, you have folks who will try to come up with different images or ways to speak about it. And this is part of the tradition he's referencing right here and in your journal handout. If you go to the page that has it where it's the apophatic and cataphatic. So our Western tradition in the church has tended towards more of this um, left-hand side, which is to say, what are the images of, for God? We're going to wrestle at these councils, and we're going to nail it down, and we're going to say, this is what it looks like, this is what you need to believe, et cetera, et cetera. In the Eastern tradition of Christianity, there was more of a tradition that, that was apophatic, and that was much more based in mystery and in the sense that we couldn't capture everything about God. And so one of the things Brian's arguing for in his video is essentially he's saying that he thinks in, in many ways the Western tradition where theology has been so focused on, well, we can for sure know. 
he's saying there's some things we miss and we lose in that when we get so focused on what we know and what we can control about who God is and we tend to make God in our image. And then he's saying there's also beauty in this other tradition that there is mystery, but we can also still say things. We can also still say that we believe things. And so for him, he's, he's arguing for us tonight, which you don't take or leave, whatever. <laughs> These are just ideas. Think about he's basically saying, what does it look like if we hold some space for both the mystery and the recognition that any image that we try to make of God isn't God? And also, still, let's wrestle and think carefully about how we do think about God because that matters. Any thoughts or your own? Yeah. Um, I often think that God can be described, but he can't be defined. I wish I could say no, that. I don't think he can be defined, yeah. So, so That's where our faith comes in. Were you just wiping your brow? Okay. <laughs> be careful if you even look like you're raising your hand. <laughs> it's like... Um, <laughs> that will be very clear. Okay, so I, I just want to share a couple things um, that are some animating of how it like how it plays out uh, and why it matters, how we understand God, the Trinity, etc. Okay, so uh, a case in point, and I had a lot of fun today because I went back to some of my old seminary papers. And my credo number two is on Trinity and subordinationism. It's so fun. <laughs> Just um, okay, so, but this is, I want to give this as a case study of how our images of God and how we think about God and the Trinity, why people actually argue about this and why it matters. Okay. Historically, throughout the life of the Christian church, there, it's been incredibly important, as we heard from the Council of Nicaea, reaffirmed at the Council of Constantinople and beyond, that God is one and that all members of the Trinity are equal, right? That um, Jesus, it's not like God the Father and then, you know, the Holy Spirit down here, which we know churches where we kind of sometimes select, right? Where we'll be like, no, we're the Holy Spirit church. And then, no, we're the Jesus church and we're the God the Father, you know? And, um, and, and so anyway, but historically in the church, there's been a sense that it's really important that we understand that God is three in one. That's a central doctrine for us and it matters. Well, um, one of the things that happened was that in the 1960s and 70s uh, in the United States, in response to rising feminist critiques of women not being able to be in leadership, and women re-engaging with the texts of our tradition to say, hey, what about Priscilla? What about Phoebe? I think they were deacons of the church. Like they're going to the scriptures and saying, hey, look, look at Galatians. Equality is something we find in the Bible. Well, as it turns out, not everyone was super into that. And if you're going to be a Christian and you're going to argue that you're right, you often go to the Bible, right? And so um, inside of some Christian circles, some folks started arguing that his, like, throughout all time in history, as long as there has been God, so forever, essentially, that God the Father is the top dog, Jesus is the next, and the Holy Spirit, we're not quite sure what to do with, so we won't talk about the Holy Spirit too much. And so within that, there... Um, uh, I started to notice this. Okay, I've always been a little nerdy because I, I was raised and I knew that I was supposed to think that like the Trinity was some weird mystery that none of us really understood, but it all went together. And then suddenly in, in like junior high and high school, I, I started recognizing that people were talking about Jesus as if like Jesus was underneath God the Father. And I was like, I'm not an expert, but I think that that's not what we're supposed to believe. 
Like, we're supposed to believe God is one, right? Now, why did this matter? Um, Let me just say a little bit about this from what I had written. So I noted here, since the early time of the early church, the doctrine of the Trinity has been a crucial tenet of the early Christian faith, or of the Christian faith. Early apologists, such as Dustin Mar- Martyr, sought to elucidate how the Christian faith was monotheistic and we were worshiping the one true God. As the church began to grow into more complete understanding of itself, um, they wrestled with this uh, understanding of Christ and the unity and diversity of the Trinity. So basically what starts to happen and, and, and transpire then is because these scholars or because folks are wanting to say women are always underneath men, it's basically like women need to submit themselves to men the way that Jesus submitted himself to God the Father. So they're trying to locate in the Trinity a perpetual, always the case, God the Father, Jesus submits. So that that way we can defend the same order in human relationships of there is man and there is woman. It's permanent subordination and that's how it's supposed to happen. Okay. It, it's, they still are trying to. Um, early seminary, Sarah got into a, a discussion with um, one of the gentlemen and I, I, I didn't know that there was actual people writing on this. Um, so I brought it up to Wayne Grudem and I don't think he liked it when I brought that up to him. But. Um, but this is, this is a big deal. It matters because if I can say, okay, um, God, the father is the head of Jesus, just as man is the head of woman. Like they're trying to make a connection there. Right. Whereas if you say, Hey, we don't really get this mystery of how God works, but there's a Trinity in Jesus and God, the father and the spirit. Um, and similarly, there's a mystery to being human. And we don't really totally get how that works either, but we're trying to figure it out. So that's just an example of how it matters the way we speak about God and what the Trinity is and how that that can play out. Um, Any thoughts or responses or your own noticings? Talk soft. <laughs> if they were trying to use that yep. as a way of keeping the superiority yep. of men, yep. um, what if they replace that with? I mean, mm. that there is no order, or I mean, I, I don't know what to. Oh, so um, so I would say that persons who are making an argument for equality. Um, they they don't really necessarily go to the Trinity. They would go, um, s- some do now, but at that time that wasn't the initial response because they weren't trying to critique the Trinity. What the major um, movement there was to say two things. One is that um, God is not male. That was one of the big arguments that they were saying then is that we need to be really intentional about understanding that even if we use he pronouns, God is not just father. God is, also we in scriptures see God defined as a mother hen. We have the spirit. We have Jesus. Um, we have these different images. So a big critique from folks who are trying to argue for equality has long been to say God is not a man or a woman. God is God. And if all of us are made in the image of God, that, then that's the next place they usually go is to say then, look at all the beautiful diversity. All of the humans are made in the image of God and, and all therefore equally make manifest the image of God. And then most of them would go to places like Galatians and et cetera, where you say there is neither Jew nor Gentile, male nor female, you know, slave nor free, because in Christ, we're all equal. And, and the way that Christ, and most people, what they would do is argue Going back to Genesis, we see in creation that there is equality, and it's only in the fall that there becomes power and fights for things. Um, And so that's where they went. And then one of the responses to that was to say, well, we will locate subordination in the Trinity, and then you can't argue with that. And then people did, and and so it continues. And I'm just saying that as a long way to say as much as I on Sunday <laughs> said, I don't care what you think about the Trinity, it's because 
if your trinity isn't centered in Jesus and love, like, I think you miss the doctrine anyway. But um, that's why it actually does matter. Um, and so the other thing that I just wanted to, to bring up, and then we'll kind of come back to some of what he's saying. He, he's talking about how our images of God, um, what were some images that came up for you all? I'll volunteer. I heard God is power, God is love, Jesus. Yeah, when I taught confirmation um, some years ago. She started out saying, when she taught confirmation some years ago. <laughs> we had a night where we talked about who is God, what is God like. And we had people come in dressed in different costumes. I think we did have a long-bearded person that sits and kind of watches but doesn't do anything. And then we had a policeman. Um, we had the, and we had Santa Claus. <laughs> That's a big one. <laughs> and, and I think we had four different ones. Um, if I look at that picture, I could pick out the fourth. But, but, but then we talked about talked about you know their idea of God and what, who God really is or what He is, really like. He's not like Santa Claus. I would have liked being in confirmation with you. I think. Um, well, and I appreciate what you naming that as well made me think about is sometimes, because um, there's no one who's going to say, well, my biblical reference for God comes from uh, Christmas, you know, 24. Jesus is Santa Claus, right? No one, no one says, oh, that's my theology of God. I think God is Santa Claus. And yet, if you listen to us talk or um, how we act, sometimes we act out a belief about who God is that is different from what we intellectually say we believe. So I had brought up um, for me how even though I always would say God was love, if I closed my eyes, I actually experienced God much more as the judge and that God uniquely thought that I was a problem. Um, and that haunted me for a long time. And so it, just that idea too of sometimes we know we say God is this, like, God is love, and yet when you look at how we live, there's a gap. And, and that's true for all of us, right? We're all in process. But when we can be aware of that, I think to his um, navigation, like, as we can be aware of those gaps and continue to meditate on scripture and images as we do our own um, inner healing work and stuff as well, can help us to navigate uh, and and be aware of our images of God and how it's showing up. Yeah. Um, just a couple other examples, thinking about God and our images of God. What would you say are, even if they're not your images, what are ways that in church you, like what are some of the most common ways you hear God referred to in church? You can just shout them out. God is Father. Yeah, absolutely. Love. Redeemer. Yep. Mighty Fortress. Yep. Savior. Rock. Yeah. Grace. Yeah. Peace. Thank you. Thank you, Lawrence. Right? God is peace. And I, um, I appreciated how he said and was talking about, too, how uh, what do our images both open up and make clear, and what can they also obscure? Right? So for a lot of folks, referring to God as Father and thinking of God as a loving Father has been really healing. It's been really wonderful. Um, and yet, what, what does it mean that God also isn't just Father? <laughs> like, what's obscured when we call God Father? How, for certain folks, does that actually isn't 
particularly helpful if that's the only image, right? And, and just being aware, because sometimes when we have our own image, like even for, right for me, God is love is a big one. What do I do with other images of God? How do they challenge what I think love looks like or feels like? Um, how do they expand it, you know, et cetera? So he's also encouraging us to think about that. One of the authors who really um, impact, impacted and impacts me and has challenged me is a writer named Sally McFaig. And Sally McFaig talks about how sometimes when we get so set on certain language, how it can at times obscure um, and get us locked in in ways of thinking. Uh, so one thing some of you may note that I do sometimes when I read a, a psalm is I'll actually read it with the um, Hebrew uh, Yahweh in the text, because it's actually in Hebrew it says Yahweh, but in English translations, it says Lord. Okay. So what comes to mind, and, and I'm totally open here to whatever you say, what comes to mind when you hear the word Lord? The person who's over everything, ruler, in charge, power, yeah. Authoritarian. Um, so oftentimes I'll use Yahweh as a way of, because recognizing we all have a lot more meaning that we're bringing to the word Lord, a lot more, there's a lot more history, even if you think of, like, I think of Lord too, and I think of, like, medieval England, right? Like, I'm waiting for the Duke to come to, you know, sort of thing. Um, but Yahweh, for most of us probably hasn't had a long history, like, we didn't grow up to church, at church where we frequently heard God called Yahweh, right? Um, and so as a way of trying to re-help us engage with the text or with an image of God that's in the text that sometimes can get obscured because um, we have such a long history of interpretation in English that's so laden with different meaning, right? Um, and so Sally McFaig talks about some of this and how also, right, like the scriptures are being written to people in a particular context, and they're trying to help them make sense of who is this God? Who is the God who is the great I am? And giving them language that they can resonate and under, with and understand. And so she, she writes about this too, about how sometimes we can get so locked into this language that we lose sight of the expansiveness of God. And we can sometimes get anxious um, you know, so what, what would happen if in, on Sundays, instead of praying our Father who art in heaven, we pray our Mother who, who art in heaven, right? Like, we would probably in this space even have different feelings about it, and we, we might be like, oh. and then you're like, well, why am I feeling that way? Is it because we're not taking scripture seriously? That might be a legitimate concern that you're holding. It might just be like, I've never heard that. And that feels really weird. I don't know what to do. We've always prayed it this way. I mean, there's all sorts of different responses that any of us would have. Um, and I just wonder for us, how do we keep letting God, who is both knowable and we can experience and how he talks about that sense of that we are embarked. Like, what does it mean for us to not clench our fists that, like, I now, I have captured God, but to allow for also the ways in which God um, can surprise and be beyond so that we can keep being open. And then being invited to, like, oh, I never thought of God that way. How does that open me up? Um, and then for me, the question always ends with, how does it help me love God and love God? my neighbor is myself more like, is this helping me? <laughs> you know? So, um, yeah. Any responses or thoughts about any of that or even your noticings about if I start praying our mother heart in heaven or God, who is the parent of all things. Um, I think it's interesting that we in the Western just culture really want to just nail everything down. And it's almost like we're afraid of the mystery. 
and um, and we think at least I have a f initial perception that well the the mystery is bad, okay, and and this is changing that in my mind a little bit, which is really kind of cool. Um, you know, you think of the Eastern mystics and and you know the Eastern Orthodoxy, the the waving of the um, incense and the, you know, all of that, you know, just feels so foreign and, and maybe my judgment is clouded by that. So this is, this is very interesting to think about, but yet for me personally, there's, there's things in the scripture that I don't understand. And I, I'm very much, I'm okay with, it's like, okay, this is bigger than me. My mind doesn't go there, but my God does, and so that's, and I have a trust and a faith in that. So, this is kind of both and. <laughs> Thanks. Any responses as Amy shared? Did it bring up anything for you all? Or? I just think vagueness is really hard. Everything be big. I like things pinned down. I like it black and white. I like to, you know, and for things to be big is really, really difficult for me. Thanks for naming that, too. That's where I like his image here. You know, he has of, um, we can sometimes hit these places where our certitude and our search for certitude uh, and those kind of strong tower things get like, I think he both in a kind of generous, which makes sense given that his book is a generous orthodoxy, I would hope he would kind of go there. <laughs> like this way of saying, hey, on the one hand, I get it. Like, it's not to say we can't say anything. And it's not to say that actually for many of us, grounding our lives on saying like, hey, it, it matters to me that Jesus is God. Like it matters to me that God is love. It it, it matters if we say God is this and not that. Um, and also how, like in how, if we don't have that, we can also end up in this place where it's like, just like, whatever. Like <laughs> I say God is love, you say God is hate, no problem. <laughs> like Like I said, you know, I would die on the God is love hill. That's something that really matters to me. I don't totally know what that means, but I have some thoughts about what it means. And so how he also named what happens, though, when we get so rigid, that also then that can, that can end up being impediment for us to be open. And so I love how he actually is like inviting us to both. And almost like I wonder, if, as an invitation for some of our personalities, you know, where might be there an, an invitation into like some of that mystery? And for some of us, where is it? Like, what really, what are the things that I say, no, it's really important to me to, to own and name this? Um, yeah, so thanks to both of you for, but this is actually, when I was looking at doctoral programs, why I didn't want to do any of the systematic theology programs, though, is because most of the systematic theology books and programs, for me, they feel like they are sure that they know. Like, I am quite sure that I have all the answers, and I already spent enough of my life being quite sure I had all the answers. Um, and that's why I wanted to actually do ethics, and the program I did was ethics and theology, because I do think the way we think about these things matters for how we live. Um, and I just always hope we have a little bit of humility about what we think so we can actually live. Um, Um, just as we're wrapping up, a couple different um, passages that I was wondering if we could take a look at um, just in our final moments here. The one is actually, um, uh, and I'm going to ask a couple different folks, and we'll just actually close out um, with these passages. And I'll walk around with the mic, and you can read read your passage aloud if, you're, if you volunteer yourself. Um, the one is if... Um, Someone would, would be able to pull up Matthew in Matthew chapter 6 with the Lord's Prayer. Would someone be game to pull? Well, I don't actually know. Do we have Bibles? 
when, if you, you can do your phone or a Bible. Um, the next one would be um, Luke 13, 34. Let's see. Which one? Do you have one, Tim? You have Matthew 6. Dave, are you going to, are you finding Luke? 13.34. And then would someone else be willing to find um, Isaiah, what section? Do? We'll do Psalm 23. Verses one through three. And then would someone um, find Philippians one six? Okay, so you have Matthew, you have Luke. Um, would you take Psalm twenty three? Oh, sure. You knew that one. Ted, would you take Philippians 1 6? Okay. Um, so I'll actually, we'll start here and we'll just. Yeah. Okay. And that's a King James Version popped up, so I'm using it. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Luke thirteen thirty four. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often have I desired to gather you, your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you were not willing. This then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day your daily bread and forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. And I am certain that God, who began the good work within you, will continue his work until it is finally finished on the day when Christ Jesus returns. So those are just a few <laughs> images from scripture of God. Um, God is shepherd, as hen, God is father, and also the reminder that God is the one who completes a work in us um, in Christ Jesus. So thanks for engaging a little bit about the conversation. Uh, next week, Christian will be teaching barring death, dismemberment, or illness. Um, and we'll be back together. So let, I'll say a prayer as we go. God, who we know by so many names, and yet I know that we know you in our beings, in our hearts, in our bodies. God, we indeed pray that you would form us to be vessels that are seaworthy. And that by the power of your spirit and your water of life that carries us, might we trust you. And might we live in this world as a people who are seeking, a people who don't maybe have all of the answers but are committed to journeying with you, with one another, and with this world to embody and to seek to at least to embody your love and your goodness. So we give you thanks in all things. In your name, many names we pray. Amen.